Chapter 24 Arthur Arthur opened his eyes and looked around, blinking a few times to get used to the sudden bright light that shone down on him with an intensity that was almost blinding. A moment ago, the tower had been dim, not to mention damp and chilly. Now, everything was sunny and warm. He was practically sweating under his tunic and tights. What's happening? he asked, trying to force his bleary eyes to focus. Something in the air smelled strangely of salt. Did the spell work? Um... Guinevere stepped up beside him, looking quite dazed herself. She was still holding the book in her hands, but the golden letters had dimmed to black. She blinked a few times, too. Then her mouth dropped open like a fish's. Oh, she whispered. Oh, no. What is it? Arthur asked, just as his vision began to clear. When he finally got a good look at his surroundings, he gasped out loud. Where are we? he whispered. One thing was for sure, they were definitely not in Merlin's leaky old tower anymore. In fact, they were not in a tower at all. But rather outside, on the ground standing on some kind of sandy patch of land on the shores of a vast sea. Where were they? And how had they ended up here? Wait, Arthur said, a slow realization beginning to wash over him. Did something in the did something in that spell he trailed off, feeling embarrassed to voice his wild theory. But still, what other explanation could there be? One moment they were in one place, the next somewhere else entirely. Don't be alarmed, Guinevere said slowly, reaching down to scoop up a handful of sand. Arthur watched as the tiny crystal slipped through her fingers and rejoined the beach below. But I think the spell didn't work exactly how I thought it would. She looked up, meeting Arthur's eyes with her own worried brown ones. Instead of returning Merlin to us, she said, I think it took us to Merlin. Arthur stared at her, for a moment unable to speak. The spell had taken them to Merlin? Merlin, who had been trapped in the future. Were they in the future? In Bermuda? An unexpected thrill pricked his skin. He knew he shouldn't be happy about his accidental time traveling. It was bound to bring about even more complications than they were already facing, which admittedly were quite a few. But still, how could he not ju be just a little bit excited about the prospect of seeing the future with his own eyes? Merlin had always talked lovingly about the future, all the amazing inventions humanity would develop and use in everyday life. Machines that traveled faster than horses, medicine that healed like magic, and hot running water inside people's own homes to bathe in any time they wanted, without having to jump into a freezing lake to do it. In fact, Merlin had claimed these people of the future were even able to fly from place to place using big winged inventions called planes. No shape-shifting necessary. And, even wilder, the world had actually become round. No, the world had always been round, he corrected himself, remembering Merlin's words. It was just now, everyone knew it. This is amazing, he cried, twirling in a circle, taking it all in. I can't believe we're here. Me neither, Guinevere agreed, though she sounded a lot less enthused. Arthur glanced at her, surprised. She looked almost frightened, wringing her hands together in front of her. On instinct, he placed a hand over hers. It's going to be all right, he assured her. We're going to find Merlin, and he'll know what to do. It was then that he spotted some kind of castle behind them, but it was unlike any castle he'd ever seen before. Three strange-looking manor houses were set in a U-shape around a court courtyard, each three stories high and featuring impossibly large glass windows lined up in triple rows all along their sides. Arthur gave a low whistle. 
He'd never seen so much glass in one in his life. And it was so smooth, too. Not bubbled or rough like the glass back home. He looked down at the courtyard, which was taken up almost entirely by a very large pond filled with the clearest crystal blue water Arthur had ever seen. Around the pond was some kind of smooth stone perimeter filled with strange-looking beds covered in brightly striped cloth. Each bed had a large cloth banner hanging above it, held up by a shiny metal stand providing shade from the sun's harsh rays. But that wasn't even the strangest part. Not by far. For lying on some of these beds were people in a horrifying state of half undress. Arthur stifled a gasp as he watched a woman wearing only two small stripes of fabric saunter by them, casually carrying a wine goblet in her hand as if it were nothing out of the ordinary to do so. Why, they're all practically naked, Guinevere gasped, joining him in taking in the scene. Have they no modesty in the future? Perhaps they have different ideas about that, Arthur rationalized. Merlin often talked about different styles, different customs, he mused. He hadn't really grasped the wizard's full meaning at the time, but now he could clearly see it for himself on full display everywhere he looked. The world had truly changed over the years, and its people along with it. And suddenly, Arthur felt the almost overwhelming desire to know everything, see everything, that this magical future had to offer. Guinevere, on the other hand, still looked rather doubtful about the whole thing. Arthur watched as her eyes drifted from people on the beds to something behind them. At least the food looks good, she observed. Arthur turned to watch a young man dressed in a crisp white shirt and short brown t- trousers walk by them carrying a heaped tray full of strange-looking but heavenly-smelling food. There was some kind of flattened brown meat, Arthur noted, placed between two slices of puffy brown bread. Accompanying the meat was a tall pile of golden-colored sticks with a splotch of thick red liquid beside them. It was all Arthur could do as the man walked by not to reach out and pluck one of the golden treasures from the plate to try for himself. Do you see Merlin anywhere? Guinevere asked, drawing his attention away from the food. Arthur scanned the courtyard again, taking in each person lying on a bed around the pond. For a moment, he worried he'd find Merlin in a state of similar undress as the others. But a further look told him the wizard was not among the pond dwellers. He pressed his lips together. No, I don't. Maybe we should ask someone, he suggested. Someone has to have seen him, right? I mean, let's be honest. Merlin doesn't exactly fit in here. Neither did they, they re- he realized suddenly, looking down as his, as, at his tunic and tights and Guinevere's heavy wool dress. He wondered if they should attempt to find more appropriate attire before beginning their quests so they could blend in with the local population. Excuse me, did you just say Merlin? Arthur rolled around at the sound of the new voice. The man who had walked by them earlier with the tray of golden sticks was now standing behind them, his tray regrettably empty. Perched on his nose were spectacles, similar to what Merlin wore, but with dark glass obscuring his eyes. How did he see out of them? The man looked at them curiously, his brows furrowing about above his glasses. Okay, seriously, is there some kind of renaissance fair going on around here that I don't know about? He asked. A fair? Guinevere asked, cocking her head in confusion, clearly not quite understanding. What kind of fair? We're just... Not from around here, Arthur tried to re- ex- explain, realizing the man was put off by their clothing as he had suspected. We're from London, he added, hoping that London was still a real place in the future. And if it was, it had a different sort of wardrobe than here. Yeah, I figured from your accents, the man said. 
Don't worry, this place is full of bricks. You must be sweltering, though, he added, gesturing to Guinevere's dress. We do have a gift shop on site with lots of summery clothing and bathing suits. If you want to find something more suitable for the beach. Gift shop. Arthur stored the words away in his mind. That must be where people receive their clothing in the future. And how nice of them to give the clothing away as gifts instead of charging money like they did in the shop slip back home. No wonder Merlin liked the future so much. Good food, free clothes, warm weather. Why, it was almost paradise. In fact, if the entire fate of England hadn't been at stake at the moment, he might have actually thought about staying here for a while himself. Um, thank you, Guinevere said. I'll, uh, keep that in mind. Arthur stepped forwards, stepped forwards, trying to steer the conversation back to the missing wizard. You asked if we mentioned Merlin. Have you seen him? We're actually looking for him. He's been gone for some time, for quite some time, and we're a little worried. The man nodded, seeming f relieved. I figured someone would come for him eventually. He didn't have an ID on him, so we couldn't call anyone. He kept babbling these nonsensical words by the pool and was starting to freak out some of the guests. Probably just too much sun for the poor guy. It happens to the best of us. He stepped. He stopped as if something had just occurred to him. Wait, you're not a wart, are you? I am, Arthur exclaimed, shocked to hear his own name spoken by a stranger in the future. I mean, that's my nickname anyway. Merlin always called me wart. I thought you might be, the man said. He gave Arthur a stern glare. Look, I don't know what kind of fight the two of you got into, but your grandfather seems really shaken up by it. It might be nice if you forgave him for whatever it was he did. I mean, trust me, I have a grandfather too. I know how they can be. But still, the poor old... Where is he? Arthur interrupted, starting to get impatient. Where can we find him? I have no idea, he said with a shrug. Security took him away a few hours ago. Like I said, he was acting really strange, mumbling to himself, telling people he's a famous wizard, like the Merlin of the King Arthur legend or whatever. Wait, Arthur said, his turn to interrupt. Did you just say King Arthur legend? He glanced at Quinn. She looked back at him, raising her eyebrows. Yeah, you know. The whole Knights of the Round Table, Guinevere, Lancelot. The man looked at them strangely. I would have thought you'd be all over that kind of thing, judging from the way you're dressed. He shook his head, looking disappointed. Kids these days, no sense of history. Uh, yes. Sorry, yes. Arthur barked in shaky laugh. Of course we know all about King Arthur and his round table, he added. Wow. Had the circular table he just installed back home in his meeting room somehow become legendary in the future? It seemed an odd detail for people to remember throughout the an annals of time, but he was flattered nonetheless. Also, who was Lancelot? He realized the man was looking at him strangely. He swallowed hard. And, uh, yes, my grandfather gets, um... Confused sometimes, he added, still fake laughing. He likes to imagine he's a time traveler from the past. Yes, the man's eyes lit up. That's right. He did say some. He did say something about time travel. He snorted, giving them a rueful grin. Between you and me, I kind of liked the old guy. He was funny, weird, but funny. He looked out over the courtyard. You see that man over there? His name's Joe. He should know where you can find Merlin. Thank you, Arthur said, feeling relief wash over him. We'll ask him. Good luck, the man said, and take care of your grandfather, won't you? We will, I promise. The man nodded and headed off in another direction. Arthur turned to Gwyn. First, let's go to the gift shop, he said. We'll get clothing to fit in better. Then we won't have to deal with questions every time we talk to someone. They headed in the direction of the gift shop which turned out to not be much, to be not much different from the shops back home in London, though the gifts were quite different in style. 
Still, after a few moments of studying the others who were shopping in the store, they were able to pick out a few items of clothing that seemed more in line with what people in the future wore, but weren't made of the barely there fabric that some seemed to prefer. Arthur grabbed a pair of brightly colored trousers that stopped at his knees and a large shirt that Guinevere translated to read, I survived the Bermuda Triangle. Arthur had no idea what that was, or if they had indeed survived it. But they were survi- but they had survived time traveling, and since there were no shirts bragging about that particular achievement, this would have to do. Guinevere emerged from the small booth used to changing clothes, looking beautiful in a long, frothy blue gown of the lightest, silkiest material Arthur had ever seen. It wrapped around her body and swathed the fabric, but left her arms uncovered. She walked up to the mirror at the end of the shop and stared at her reflection. I don't know, she murmured, looking doubtful. She turned to Arthur. Do you think this is suitable? I think you look lovely, he said honestly. And when Guinevere smiled, he knew he'd said the right thing. Now come on, let's find a Merlin. Merlin. They started to head out of the shop, but before they got to the doors... A woman wearing a colorful flowered shirt suddenly stepped into the path. Are you planning to pay for those, she asked, looking at them angrily. Arthur frowned confused. Aren't they meant to be gifts, he asked. This is a gift shop, right? Yes. Very funny. The woman rolled her eyes, dragging them both back to a small table in the center of the shop on which there sat a strange machine Arthur didn't recognize. She reached over and plucked a paper tag off each of their outfits. The dress is $39.99, she said. I'll throw in the shirt and shorts for an extra 60, for an even 60. It took Arthur a moment to realize she was talking about money. He should have known the gifting idea was too good to be true. No future could be that perfect. Guinevere glanced at him. Do you have any coins? She whispered. Did he? Arthur reached into his satchel, feeling around. Being king, he normally had no reason to carry around gold on his person. But he had distributed coins to the poor a few days before and managed to find one leftover coin at the bottom of his bag. He pulled it out, holding it up to the woman. I only have this, he said apologetically. Will it do? The woman stared at the coin, her eyes widening to saucers. She reached out and plucked it from Arthur's hand. Is this gold? She asked, looking quite astounded. Arthur watched as she bit down on it with her teeth, then stared at it again. Is it enough? Arthur asked worriedly. But the woman was ignoring him now. She had set down the coin on the table and was tapping on a small black object with a glass face in her hand. A moment later, she looked up. Is this real? She asked suspiciously. It says on the internet it's from the Middle Ages. Um, yes. It's very old, Guinevere agreed, and very valuable. She glanced at Arthur. He held his breath. It's also all we have to pay for the clothes. Is that all right? Yes, the woman replied excitedly, hastily slipping the coin in her pocket. Then she seemed to remember herself. I mean... I suppose it'll do. She reached behind the table and handed them two hats and two pairs of the dark glass spectacles that the man had been wearing. Take these sunglasses too, she said hurriedly. It's really bright out there. Guinevere and Arthur dutifully took the hats and placed them on their heads. Arthur felt a little ridiculous in his, which fit fine, but had a strange little brim that shielded his eyes. Gwen, on the other hand, looked rather lovely in her wide, straw-brimmed bonnet that wasn't much different from what the serfs wore in the fields back home. Then he tried the sunglasses, resting them on his nose as he'd seen the others do. Suddenly, his vision dimmed. Startled, he ripped them off his head. They make you go blind, he exclaimed. Oh yeah, they're a little dark on the dark side. But trust me, You'll thank me once you get outside. 
That sun is brutal today. I can't believe you've been out there without them. Thank you, Guinevere piped in. We appreciate it. She grabbed her own sunglasses and began to drag Arthur out of the shop. Have a nice day, the woman called out after them before turning to her next guest. I'm glad she took that coin, Guinevere remarked once they were outside again. I'm not sure what else we could have offered her. Arthur nodded, setting glasses, setting the sunglasses on his nose again. This time, they didn't blind him entirely. But it was as if someone had turned off a very large lamp. What a brilliant invention, he marveled, taking them off for a moment to stare down at them before returning them to his face. Those working in the fields back home could greatly benefit from something like this. Maybe we should invent it for them, Guinevere said with a smile. Once you're not king, you're bound to have a lot of time on your hands. Why, you'll be able to do all sorts of interesting things in your life. Arthur nodded, his enthusiasm deflating a bit as he, as he was reminded of their mission. As fascinating as the future was, they weren't here as, as guests on a holiday. They were here to learn whether Merlin had really decided to make him king and how he could successfully abdicate the throne without managing, managing to get his head chopped off in the process. Guinevere caught his eye. Come on, she said. Let's go speak to this Joe. They headed over to the man who had been identified as Joe. When they approached, he was tapping on one of the same rectangular glass objects the woman in the gift shop had been using. Excuse me, Arthur ventured. I'm sorry to bother you. We're looking for a man named Merlin. He's old, maybe dressed in a blue hat and robes. Do you happen to know where he is? The man looked up from his object, frowning for a moment. Then a flicker of recognition crossed his face. Oh, you must mean the old dude from this morning, he said. We brought him down to the infirmary. I think he got too much sun, he shrugged. Not sure if he's still there. Where's the infirmary? Guinevere asked. The man pointed down a path, then turned back to tapping on his glass rectangle. Conversation clearly over. Arthur really wanted to ask him what the rectangle did and why everyone seemed to be so fascinated by it. But he knew it would just make him stand out again. Instead, he turned to Guinevere. Come on, he said. Let's go find him. They dashed down the path as directed, following the little white signs with red crosses that read infirmary, according to Gwen. At the end of the path, they came across a small white story building with the same red cross painted on its door. They glanced at each other excitedly. This must have been it. Come on, Arthur said, and headed through the doors. Inside, it was also white and really clean. In fact, it might have been the cleanest place Arthur had ever seen, and he wondered how they kept it so pristine. In the center of the room was a woman with black hair and neat braids, sitting behind a table, wearing an outfit that was also white and clean, to match the room, Arthur assumed. Excuse me, he said, walking up to the woman. Do you have a man named Merlin here by any chance? The woman looked up from yet another small black rectangle. These people of the future really seemed to love whatever these things were. Merlin, she repeated, looking a little drained. Oh, he's here, all right, she rolled her eyes. Just follow his loud bell yacking, yatching down the hall. You can't miss him, she groaned. And please, take him with you when you leave. My, brain, my mind grain will thank you. We will, Arthur promised, though he had no idea who the migraine was or why would they would thank him for retrieving his teacher. Now where, Higginus, Bigginus, no, no, no! Arthur's eyes lit up. Merlin, he cried. There was no mistaking his teacher's voice. He started running down the corridor, fast as his feet could take him. He could feel his heart pound in excitement as they reached the door at the end. The chanting was louder here, definitely coming from the other side of the wall. Arthur grinned widely. Merlin, we found you at last. 
Chapter 25, Arthur. Merlin! Arthur yanked open the door, bursting into the room. His heart swelled and his eyes fell on his teacher, who was sitting up in a small bed and waving his hands in front of his face. Merlin was dressed oddly in a strange thin cotton robe printed with drawings of cute baby ducks, and his beard looked in desperate need of a br brushing. But it was him. There was no mistaking it. Merlin! Arthur cried again, his heart feeling as if it would burst with joy. Oh, Merlin, it's so good to see you! The old wizard looked up, his watery blue eyes light lighting in recognition. War? he exclaimed, his voice filled with astonishment. Am I dreaming? Is that really you? It's really me, Arthur assured him, crossing the room and throwing his arms around his teacher, giving him a huge hug. Merlin grunted a little, clearly surprised at the unexpected gesture of affection, but he managed to pat Arthur awkwardly on the back before they parted again. Arthur smiled down at him. It's so good to see you, he gushed. Are you all right? Oh, I'm fine, Merlin huffed, looking down at his strange attire. It was then Arthur noted he had a tube of some sort sticking out of his arm. The tube led to a small bag hanging from a pole and containing clear liquid. Merlin caught Arthur's worried look. Don't mind that, he said quickly. They're just trying to rehydrate me. For some reason, they've convinced I've got heat stroke. He snorted, as if I would ever allow myself to get heat stroke. Why, if I could survive a dragon blast in the middle of the Sahara, surely I can deal with a paltry son of 21st century Bermuda. Arthur bit back a laugh. It was Merlin, all right, and he hadn't changed a bit. I'm just happy you're here, he said, pulling up a chair and sitting beside the wizard. I have so much to tell you. So much has happened since you've been gone. Of course it has, Merlin grumped. I'm sure she's taken full advantage of my absence to cause as much havoc as possible. He made a disgrup. He made his disgusted face. I should have picked a longer-lasting disease, he muttered. That would have shown her not to trifle with me. Arthur frowned. Who are you talking about again? He asked, though he had a sneaking suspicion he, suspicion he knew. Madam Mim, of course, Merlin blurted. Try to keep up. He squeezed his hands into fists. I'm positive she's the one who tangled with my spell-casting skills, making it impossible for me to get back home. I can still time travel, you see, but I'm unable to pinpoint where or when I want to go. You can't imagine all the places I've been to since I first left you in the tower. The 20th century, the 22nd century. I don't recommend that one bit, by the way, he added as an aside. He tapped his fingers to his chin. Then there was the tw 12th, tw 12th century. That was one actually quite pleasant, if you must know. Almost felt like home. But now I'm here, in the 21st century, where no one seems to believe a thing I say, he sighed dejectedly. And maybe they're right. All this has surely scrambled my noggin, and no type of hydration is going to help with that. He stared bitterly down at the clear tube in his arm, as if blaming it for everything. Arthur nodded dutifully, though in truth, he had only understood about half of what the wizard was saying, but he was used to that, he supposed, and nothing could damp dampen his joy of being back with his teacher. So, you can't go, you can't get back home? He tried to interpret. Of course I can't get back home. Haven't you been listening to a thing I've been saying? Merlin burst out. He shook his head, his long white beard swinging from side to side. It couldn't have been easy for Mim to do this, so I assume she had some kind of nefarious reason for doing it. Or maybe she's just still bitter that I beat her in that duel, even though she's the one who cheated in the first place. He waved his fists in the air. Why, if I get my hands on her again? He was interrupted by a small, anxious squeak. Arthur whirled around, remembering for the first time since he'd seen Merlin that he hadn't come alone. Guinevere was hovering by the doorway, wringing her hands together nervously. Merlin also seemed to have noticed her for the first time. Excuse me, young lady, do you mind? We're trying to have a private convert. He stopped short. 
His eyes widened, so wide that for a moment Arthur thought they would pop out of his head. What's wrong, Merlin? He asked. No, his teacher murmured. It can't be. Guinevere flinched, almost as if she'd been stru struck. She started to back away. Arthur's heart beat uncomfortably. Uncom what was going on here? Why did they look like they knew each other? Camille? Merlin questioned. Then he shook his head. No, that can't be right. Camille would be older now. You're just a child, but you look so much like her. A daughter? But then she never had any more children after... His face turned bright white. You're not. You can't be. This is Guinevere, Arthur blurted out, unable to stand the suspense any more. She's my new friend. She saved my life and helped me cast the spell for us to get here to find you. Guinevere, Merlin whispered in disbelief. Then his eyes lit up and his face broke out into a huge grin. Guinevere, you're alive and practically grown up too. Wh what? Guinevere stammered, still looking as if she was about to bolt from the room. Oh, your parents are going to be so happy when they find out, Merlin gushed clapping his hands together with glee. This is the best news ever! You must be mistaken, Guinevere protested. My parents are... dead. Her mouth dipped to a frown, then something deemed to flicker across her face. Something very dark that Arthur had never seen before from his friend. You know they're dead, she added with more force. You... She sucked in a breath. You killed them! Wait, what? Arthur cried. He couldn't have been more shocked if Guinevere had just accused Merlin of masquerading as a purple polka-dotted dragon. What are you talking about, Quinn? Guinevere turned to him. Her brown eyes flashed fire. I'm sorry, Arthur, but you need to know the truth. Your precious Merlin killed my parents in cold blood when I was just a baby. And he tried to kill me, too. No, Arthur cried hurriedly horrified. That's impossible. Merlin wouldn't do that. He turned to his mentor. Would you? He asked, suddenly feeling a flicker of doubt. Of course not, Merlin sputtered, sounding angry. Why would I kill her parents? They're dear friends of mine. He stroked his beard. Also, they're not dead. Well, at least not back in our rightful time. So there's that too. Now it was Guinevere's turn to look confused. What are you talking about? Of course they're dead, she said, but Arthur could hear a thread of doubt in her voice, mixed with a thread of painful hope. Actually, King Leo de, de Grants of the summer country and his wife Camille are very much alive, Merlin replied. You're the one who's supposed to be dead. You're lying, Guinevere spit out. You have to be lying, her voice caught on the words. You're trying to trick me. Merlin shrugged. I'm happy to prove it to you. If we ever get out of this place, Queen Camille is just going to be beside herself with joy when she finds out. She never did have another child after you disappeared from your cradle that night. She was too distraught by losing you. Guinevere just stared at him, not replying. Her knees trembled, and Arthur ran to grab her before they buckled out from under her. Quinn, it's all right, he whispered. This is good news, right? Guinevere turned to him, her eyes filled with tears. Yes, but how can it be true? How can it possibly be true? Who told you they were dead? Arthur asked. Was it your foster mother? Maybe she didn't know? Quinn's face twisted, and Arthur's heart squeezed at the pain and betrayal he saw cross her, fa cross her face. Whoever had told her this lie had clearly been someone she trusted. And now she was doubting everything she'd ever been told, maybe for her entire life. Quinevere squeezed her eyes shut, then opened them again. Her shoulders drooped as if all the fight had gone out of her. Arthur watched as she bit her lower lip, then shuffled from foot to foot. Quinn, he placed a hand over hers, but she jerked it away. She gave Merlin one last look then mumbled an apology and fled the room. Worried, Arthur started after her, but Merlin stopped him at the door. No, lad, he said gently. 
It will do no good to chase her down. Let her have the time she needs to sort her thoughts. She'll come back when she's ready. Arthur reluctantly turned back to his mentor. He knew Merlin was right, even if he didn't want him to be. He sighed deeply. This has all turned out to be such a mess, he moaned. Ever since the day you left, nothing has been normal since. Merlin frowned. Maybe you should start at the beginning. Tell me everything that's happened since I've been away. He stroked his beard. For example, did you ever go to that blasted tournament? What clod-headed oaf managed to win the ki- the thing? Who's our new king? Well, Arthur began. Merlin scowled. Oh, no. Don't tell me it was that lunkhead Kay. He's the last person on earth who should be wearing the crown. Though I'm sure Min would love it. All the chaos he would end up causing. It would be a disaster. Just as she likes it. His voice trailed off as he caught Arthur's um, expression. Well, what is it, boy? For goodness sake, you look like you swallowed a bee. He shook his head. Don't leave me in suspense. Who's the king of England? Arthur felt his cheeks turn bright red. It's, well, sort of, um, me? Merlin's eyebrows furrowed. He stared at Arthur for a moment, and Arthur could see the smoke coming from his brain. I, uh, pulled the sword from the stone, he added weakly. Well, I'll be. Merlin suddenly let out a huge whooping cheer startling Arthur and forcing him to take a quick step back. You pulled the sword from the stone? The legendary sword Excalibur? That's the one, Arthur agreed. Evidently, whoever pulls it out is meant to be king. Yes, of course, I know the legend. I just had no idea it was about you. Though I suppose it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I always knew you were meant for greatness, of course. It does? Arthur stared at Merlin, perplexed. You did? Ever since that day, you crashed through my roof, the wizard grinned. After all, why do you think I took such an interest in your education? I don't know. I guess I just thought you were being nice, Arthur said. His mind was whirring with confusion and a bit of wor- little bit of worry. Merlin didn't seem too surprised about his student's very unlikely destiny. Was that because the wizard had planned it all along? Arthur shuffled from foot to foot. Merlin, he began, not knowing how to bring it up. What is it, lad? You didn't... I mean, you hadn't just... By some means... Well, spit it out, boy. What are you talking about? You didn't plan this. You didn't plan this? You didn't cast a spell on the sword so only I could pull it out and it would look like a miracle? Merlin's eyes widened. Why on earth would I do a thing like that? Arthur shrugged, squirming a little. I... I mean, I I don't know, he stammered. So maybe you could rule through me? For a moment, Merlin was speechless. He stared at Arthur, his expression unreadable. Then he leapt out of bed, ripping out the tube attached to his arm. Arthur winced, not sure that was the best way to go about it. Merlin stalked towards Arthur. Have you just met me, lad? He demanded, you think I wanted to be king of England? Arthur took a small step backwards, looking a little frightened. The last time he'd seen his teacher so agitated was just before he'd blown himself to Bermuda. And Arthur really didn't want to have to track him down in yet another time period just to finish their conversation. Merlin, sit down, he begged. It was just a theory. Well, it was a very bad theory, he sputtered, with no factual evidence to back it up. He huffed and plopped back down on the bed, looking extremely miffled, miffed. Besides, even if I wanted to do something like that, it wouldn't work. The magic of the sword and the stone goes deep. No mere wizard could just disenchant it on a whim to allow a person of their choosing to pull it out. Otherwise, someone would have done it a long time ago. Arthur drew in a breath, his thoughts whirling in his head. So then, you're saying that you're the foretold king of of all England? Merlin shrugged. 
It certainly appears so. Arthur felt his heart skip a beat. Could it be? Could he really be the true king after all? It seemed impossible. Yet what other explanation could there be? Certainly no one else would w want him to be king or have the ability to make it happen. He felt an unexpected thrill spin up his spine. He hadn't realized how much he'd been hoping for this until it actually happened. Of course, there's only wh what? There's only way to find out for sure. Merlin added, "We need to consult the internet."